Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about marking gauges, particularly the wheel style gauge. I'm going to tell you why it's my favorite. I'm going to show you what to look for when getting one. And I'm also going to show you how best to use it, at least the way I do it. Stay with me. There are a few different types of gauges. I didn't start off with a wheel gauge. I started off with a, what you might call a pin gauge. Now they also make a slitting gauge. It has a wedge in there and a knife. The pin gauge, which I think is the most common, gives you literally a, uh, a round pin. And unless you know enough on how to go in there, you can tell by the file marks that I've went in there and modified it. If you don't, when you drag that across the grain, it just tears and scratches, it's terrible. Slitting gauge works a little bit better, but doesn't always work very well when you're going parallel to the grain. So the biggest reasons that I prefer the wheel style gauge, actually there's a few of them. Number one, it's extremely easy to sharpen. I'll, I'll discuss that later. Number two, when you set a pin style gauge down on your board, as soon as you sit it down, you lose sight of the pin because this beam is in the way and it obscures it. So if you're trying to stop, and oftentimes if I'm building a piece of furniture, and I don't want to deal with a gauge line, I can go in, I want to be able to start at the edge of the pin and move over to the other side and then lift it up and go and then start in the next one. Doing that with this style of gauge is very difficult because it's just a whole bunch of trial and error because as I said, you can't see where the pin is. Whereas with the wheel style, you can literally roll that last little bit, go over, roll one way or the other to finish the cut, very easy to do. So for those reasons, I wouldn't recommend this be your starting gauge, I, although I started out with it. There are better options today. So let's go on to the next one. Using your marking gauge. Let's kind of cover all the bases. First thing you want to make sure, obviously the cutter's going to be sharp, but you want to make sure that that's tight. This is not designed to rotate. If it does, it's not going to work nearly as well. So make sure that's good and snug. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that the face of your tool is nice and flat. Now I've square, I've straightened the end of the board. It's going to make it a lot easier to, for this to follow. First thing we do is need to set it. And you'll also notice that the bevel faces the tool. When that drags, when that is pulled through the wood, if the bevel's on this side, it's going to pull the tool this way, keeping the, it tight to the end of the board. And there's occasion when you may turn it around, but be aware that it's going to be very hard to control. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set it. So I just put a little bit of tension on the, on the uh, thumb screw. If I want that at three quarter, I've got to come out a little bit farther so I can just tap the rod. Went a little bit too far, tap the cutter. Okay, I'm going to get it where I want it, lock that down nice and tight. Now if I'm going to scribe all the way around this board, I find it much easier to pull. I hold it so that the, uh, the uh, thumb screw is in between my thumb and my index finger. You want to concentrate on the head of the tool up against the end of the board. Forget about the cutter. That's not, that's going to do its job, but keeping it tight here is what's really important. Now, you can do it all in one pass, or if you find it a little more easier to control, if you do it in several light passes. So pull it toward yourself. If you need it to be a little deeper cut, you can come back and do it as many times as you need. Focusing again on where the cutter interacts with the end of the board. You want to keep it so that the rod is parallel to the board you're working on. You don't want it tipped one way or the other. That way it's going to give you a nice clean line and that line is going to be, or that what's been cut is going to be square on this side, the bevel's on this side. So as you remove the material and then go to join something against that line, you're going to get a nice tight fit. Now, when it comes to doing the edges, it's not, there's not a lot of reference surface here in order to run across that tool. So what I sometimes do is just roll it a couple times if you need to, and you get a nice clean line on there as well, and then go all the way around. Real easy. Now I'll share with you what I look for in a marking gauge cutter, and that's why we incorporated all of these features in the ones we make. If you have one, I'll show you what to look for and uh, how to fix it if it needs to be repaired. So first of all, the rod. Um, there's some that have graduations on there. I never use that for the simple reason that in order to be really accurate, if I'm measuring the thickness of this piece so that I can match if I'm going to cut dovetails in two different thicknesses of a piece of wood or even the same thickness, I need to know how far down this piece to cut. 
and that's going to be determined by the thickness of this piece. I find the most accurate way to do it, lay it on a flat surface, hold it like so, let that drop, and then lock it. I don't need any graduations to tell me, and that's going to be exactly the thickness of that piece. Or you can, if you don't want to do that, you can put it on another piece of wood. Same thing, drop it down, lock it, and now you've got that exact measurement. So that takes into something else. You want to make sure that the screw that holds your cutter on is recessed in, not sitting up on the surface, because that will, that will instantly remove that function. You want this surface to be nice and flat, and I'm going to show you how to, how to go in and repair that as well. So don't bother with the graduations. I have them on this, but I never use it. You want the end of the, the head of the uh, tool to be nice and flat. So put in a straight edge on there. If there's any kind of a bump, that's going to wobble when you use it. Now what you can do, if you've got a disc sander, you can go up against that, or you can just put a piece of sandpaper on a flat surface. Now the problem is that if it's, if it's rounded over, it's going to want to rock on you, and it makes it very difficult to do. But somehow you've got to go in there and hone that until you get that surface nice and flat. I also like to have a little bit of a recess right there, so when the cutter goes in, it'll drop right below the surface and it stays nicely protected. If you don't have a flat spot, you can file one on there. If not, it's going to roll off your bench, and the first time that fragile cutter hits the concrete floor, there goes that cutter. So you'll want to put on something like that so when you set it down, it stays put. Um, you also There's some that actually have an O-ring inside, and I find that's more of a pain in the rear end than anything else. The problem is, when you're trying to get that last little movement, that O-ring wants to roll, and as you move it, it wants to come back on you. So no, no O-rings in there. You, you want a fairly close fit, and you want a large diameter thumb screw so you can get a lot of torque on that to hold that nice and firm. You do not want that moving on you while you're trying to make a measurement. It doesn't, doesn't really matter how long this rod is because once you get out beyond about there, there's just not enough surface area here to control that. There's a lot of resistance out here where the cutter is, and you don't have a lot of air surface area here to register. So. This is more for weight and balance than it is anything else because I would never try to use that way out there like that. Okay, sharpening. Let's get right to it. The first thing you want to do is take your cutter off. Now, this has a Phillips screw. Some of them have a little Allen wrench. Really snug that up so I can get a hold of it. Depending on how bad it is, this is in good shape, but if it's really bad or it's not flat, now, how do you tell if it's not flat? Set it down on your stone. I'm using a diamond plate, and that's really a thousand grit is as, far, as, high, as uh, fine a surface as you need. But just start to rub it a little bit like that. And if you look and you don't see the scratch pattern going right out to the edge, then you know you've got some work to do. In that case, you might want to start on the coarser side. This is a 300 grit. But in my case, I'm just, re I'm just sharpening it, so I'll just put a little bit of cutting fluid on there, set it on, hold on to it like so, just a little bit of downward pressure and just two small tight circles. Now every once in a while I'll rotate it just so that I'm putting pressure down in different spots. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our newsletter has subscriber only content, monthly discount on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. Then as soon as you can actually feel it cut, and by that I mean, if you hold it in your fingers and you can drag it across a piece of wood and get a nice cut, you can see the cut line, then you know you are where you need to be. I'll take that up a little bit higher. I wouldn't imagine having to do this more than once a year. Now some will take it up to a much higher grit, but Really, for this function, a thousand grit, I think, is plenty. You want to be careful because these, these will cut you. Put that back in place. And you'll be good for another six months to a year. You can tell when it's sharp because you can feel it with your finger and it, it has a biting edge. That's how you sharpen them. Okay, I want to show you some of the functions or some of the things that I use my marking gauge for that may not be what you would can think of as a traditional use. 
This small cutter is only three eighths of an inch in diameter and it's very obtuse, so it's quite robust. So if you're cutting a mortise and you've got a bump in the bottom, you can switch out, set that down in there, let it drop to the bottom. Now, if that's the bottom and I've got a, a little bit deeper, I've got a bump to remove, I'm gonna bring that cutter out just a little bit farther, lock it, and I can drop that in, and now I can go side to side and free up any material that might have been stuck in there. Obviously, you can't do it with a larger diameter cutter, and since you're gonna be doing a bit of prying, you want that to be pretty stout. There's one use. Now, if you're cutting mortises, you have to lay out your mortise, you have to lay out your tenon, everything comes off of your mortise chisel. So, you can take our mortise gauge, again, swap, you don't have to bother removing cutters, you just take out one rod and put in another. You open up the little handle on the end, wind back that second cutter, put your mortise chisel in between the two, wind that up tight, and then lock it with a little brass knob. And now that perfectly represents the thickness of your mortise chisel. You can use that to lay out your tenon. You can also use it to come in and lay out your mortise, giving you the exact dimensions. Now, if you like to be really fussy, when I'm dealing with softwoods like pine, alder, aspen, they have a tendency to crush under the, even under the pressure of a sharp knife. So I have a 7 16 diameter cutter, and it is really acute. Now that doesn't stand up very well in hardwoods, but in softwoods it works tremendously well because it is so sharp and the angle is so um, acute. Now when you come in there, that just gives you a beautiful cut line. Now this might not happen nearly as often, but occasionally when you're working with angled surfaces, the problem is that your cutter won't reach. You're actually, the rod is hitting this. So what you can do, we have a 5 8 diameter cutter. Swap that out. And now that extra length will actually allow you to go in and make your mark. Lots of applications. When you're done with them, you store them in your tube so they stay just as sharp for the next time you're going to get used. Here's my last bit of advice, and this is going to be a bit self-serving. If you're doing this in a serious way, even as a hobbyist, you're going to find the more marking gauges you have, the better off it is. Now, I would suggest three. Why? Well, if you're doing a mortise and tenon, you've got one set up as your mortise gauge. You've got one set up to do all of your single lines. If you're doing dovetails and you've got two different thicknesses, tailboard and pinboard, it's nice to have one set for the tailboard, one for the pinboard, so you're not having to go back and forth. The fewer times you have to set up and make the change, the less opportunity there is to screw up. Either way, marking gauge is a fantastic tool. Sharpen it up, learn about it, and you'll find lots of uses for it. It's fantastic. It'll help increase your craftsmanship. Good luck. If you like my work and enjoy my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos and help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the link below, the chisel and plane icon, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our online and in-person workshops.